Today, I'm going to build a ZIF-64 to make the diagnosis and repair of the many machines I have to repair over the next year much more efficient. All right. While waiting for the parts to come in for the PET 4032, I was looking at the numerous Commodore 64 and 128 machines that I need to restore over the next couple of years. While the Retro Chip Tester Pro should be useful for testing RAM and ROM and TTL ICs like the ubiquitous 74 series, we still need to be able to verify that custom chips that appear to be bad have indeed failed. It seems to me that the logical next step is to build a ZIF 64. That's a Commodore 64 with zero insertion force sockets installed for each of the major proprietary ICs. If you're not familiar with a ZIF socket, it has a lever that allows an IC to be inserted with zero force and then closing the lever clamps down on the IC pins preventing damage to the IC and wear on the socket. To make this, I'll need a case, keyboard, and main board from an existing Commodore 64. I don't want to sacrifice a good machine for that, so what I thought we'd do is why don't we take a look at Carl's parts bin and see what we can find in here. And yep, some of these are clearly parts machines. Wow, that thing's a mess. I don't know what happened, but I don't think it was good. <laughs> I'm hoping we can find some parts in here. Like there's a, yeah, it's messed up, but there's a keyboard. And that's a keyboard labeled parts. I don't have any idea what's wrong with it, but it all feels fine. The shift lock works. So let's set that one aside. Carl's parts board, that looks promising. What else we got here? So that's a 250407, 326298 Rev A. So not what I'm looking for. Okay, so here's a bottom case with a 250407, but I'm thinking of using this board. This, uh, this board's already had a lot of uh, desoldering done on it. So it seems like the logical choice. It's been uh, used as a parts board. All right, so here we have all the parts I think I need to put together a ZIF 64. And then quite a while ago, I went ahead and stocked up on ZIF sockets and they are cheap, crappy sockets. But to be honest, when I looked at uh, what the cost of a good ZIF socket was, on uh, DigiKey, it was insane. I mean, like 30, 40 bucks a socket, I'm sorry, I am not made of money, not even close. So I think my first step here is going to be to get some of these pins straightened out on some sockets and see how they fit. Gotta get all these stupid bent pins straightened. While I straighten the pins, I wanna mention that the reason I wanna use a 250407 revision board as if it's one of the most common boards out there, especially since the machines I'm repairing are heavily weighted towards the earlier bread bins. Okay, so I've come up with a plan. First, I'll need to relocate a few components to the back of the board because the ZIF sockets are larger than standard ones, leaving a few components in the way. I'll desolder the parts from the front side of the board, then I'll simply resolder them onto the back in a manner that allows them to lie flat. Fortunately, these components are mostly small ceramic capacitors, so they shouldn't interfere with reinstalling the board back into the case. For the ZIF sockets, normally I always associated the lever with the pin one end, so they would go like this, but there's several instances here where that's not going to work. But it looks like it'll work fine if they are this way, so I'm just going to have to mark this end as pin one, and I'm gonna put them all the same orientation so it's not confusing. And then I'm gonna to have to remove this shield because it is in the way. And then finally, after I clean up this board, I have to keep the label. I really like the label, even though somebody else wrote that on it because Carl is spelled with a K, not a C. So I'm not sure who labeled this but clearly it was not Carl. I have to say, Carl, you did a good job on your desoldering here. Looks really nice. As usual, for desoldering, I use a little flux, add some fresh solder to get the old stuff flowing, then remove it with a desoldering tool. 
After that, some desoldering braid removes any residual solder and the part is easily removed. Then it's resoldered to the back of the board. To hold it in place while I'm soldering, I just use a little blue painter's tape. All right, so that capacitor is laying flat on the bottom of the board. And that should leave me plenty of space to install the ZIF socket. All right, so I am gonna go ahead and reposition all the caps and I'll be back when that's done. I also removed the RF shield around the VIC-2 chip at this time, along with the copper tape that used to connect the RF shield to the grounded metal cartridge port frame. The way it was in here, it was going to short things out as soon as power was applied. The hardest part when installing the ZIF sockets was getting all the pins aligned with the holes. This is not an issue I remember back in the day when I think the sockets had rigid pins that did not easily bend. I still had to work around a couple components that could not be easily moved, but the only ones that made me work were around the VIC-2 graphics chip, where I had to install a standard double wipe socket as a riser, then insert the ZIF socket into it. Okay, let's see how the first smoke test went. Do you see it? Just a power on smoke test without any ICs installed, just to see what happens. This was marked as part, so who knows. No smoke, no fire, no video signal, of course. Still oblivious, I proceeded to install a chipset and test it again, but it still didn't work. Do you see it yet? There you go, Mike. Now you see it, dork. I suppose a voltage regulator might help. Fortunately, I have plenty on hand, so it's just a quick replacement. I also installed a 74LS257 in the empty socket. See so what that does. Probably nothing, of course. Oh, look at that. We have a screen. Now we're getting somewhere. Let's start with a dead test and see what we get. Since it's boarded and parted out, I think expecting it to work would have been a bit too optimistic. Interesting, the screen looked right for just a second. And now it's garbage. Clearly I have an issue with one of the uh, CIAs. So I got enough life, I'm gonna try the Diac cartridge. I'm gonna need the harness. With the diagnostic cartridge, it would start to test, but always crashed after a few seconds. So I went back to the dead test. Since the right clock output was always wrong on the test, I figured I should go ahead and swap out the bad CIA before diagnosing the other issues. All right, so now those are matching up. So I will mark this as bad. Needs some work, but man, it's better than I thought it would be by a long shot. Nothing on the sound because again, no chip. Why? Why put one in there until we're ready for it? Okay, the dead test looks good now, so back to the diagnostic cartridge. I think I will come back tomorrow and do some diagnostics if this doesn't pass, which it will not. Ah, uh, the SID's bad, what do you know? Holy cow, this board passed. Let's put a SID in here. All right, last one, 6581. I have no idea about the status of this chip. It was... I did not like that sound. The machine makes a nasty staticky noise when powering up and has a black screen. Uh, apparently the SID is bad, so I'll give the back SID I have on hand a try. Nope, same problem. <laughs> or so I thought. So, something is wrong with that socket. Hopefully I didn't just kill the back SID. I came back the next day fresh and ready to tackle what I thought was going to be a board issue. In the interest of brevity, I'm going to spare you the bulk of the diagnostics on the board. No matter how I edited this part, it just came out boring, so I'm just going to cut to the chase. Long story short, I know, too late. There's nothing wrong with the board. 
After toning out all the pins looking for open or shorted connections on the socket and finding nothing, I tried the bad SID on another board and lo and behold, it had a black screen. Next, I tried the back SID on the other machine and it worked fine. Puzzled, I returned the back SID to the ZIF64 and the machine started. After a bit of fiddling and more than a little swearing, I discovered that the way the pins are set up on the back SID, they can get hung up on the edge of the ZIF socket and not seat properly. From above, it looks fine, but the issue is clearly visible from the side. If the back SID does this in a particular way, you end up getting a black screen. This is not going to happen with regular ICs, so I just have to keep this in mind when I'm dealing with modern replacements. Freaking Murphy's Law bites me again. Murphy's Law doesn't mean that something bad will happen. What it means is that whatever can happen will happen, and that sounds just fine with us. Whoa. Finally, I had to swap some case parts because the ones I had did not align with each other. They're just completely different molds. And then I cleaned up the keyboard, which seems to work just fine. So now all that's left to do is let's check out some of the chips from Carl's stash. I started with a tube of chips labeled maybe good. Doesn't sound promising, does it? So after testing all the ICs that I could test on this machine, here's what I found. Of four 6526 CIAs, two were good and two were bad. A 6510 processor worked just great. Of three SIDs I tested, one of them's bad, causing the machine to crash almost immediately. The other two have clicking sounds, so I'm not too optimistic. That's probably what Carl meant when he said, may be good. There was a sweet ceramic VIC-2 chip, but unfortunately it has really fine vertical lines throughout everything. Finally, I did test one kernel ROM because I was curious which version it was, but it was an unknown checksum, so I'm assuming it's bad. Okay, while I was making this video, many pet parts arrived, so I'll be back on that next. I hope you liked this video. Check out this one where I took a first look at the pet I'm working on, and check out this Commodore 64 with a psychedelic screen. Thanks for coming!